Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Good morning. Uh, welcome you all to this next lecture in this particular uh, course on uh, analytical spectral and microscopy applications of inorganic compounds and nanomaterials. For the past couple of classes, we have been looking at the NMR spectroscopy, which is very different from that of the solution NMR. Just to give a quick uh, go through, let me look at and because the inorganic NMR is primarily concerned with the solid state, also concerned with the paramagnetic. So, I have started with, a, uh, with this uh, solid state uh, inorganic NMR. Prior to that, I built uh, basics of uh, NMR and the field dependence of the frequency, etc. and the gyromagnetic ratios, dependence of the frequency of a nucleus. All of these, then I talked to you about the solution NMR with the diamagnetic organic molecules and how they are well resolved all of those and the proton chemical shift ranges for various things uh, all of these we have looked at and uh, then uh, i have given you the basic concept as why nmr of our inorganic differs largely from that of the organic because it is primarily done in solid state and in the solid state also the point of fate is one is solid state second is a variety of nucleus Whereas in, proton, uh, in uh, organic, primarily the proton and the carbon NMR is good enough. And for 90 or 90 plus percent of the time or more than that is enough. But that is not sufficient for the inorganic NMR because inorganic uh, um, compounds come from variety of metal ions, main group elements, many other. So therefore, one needs to have NMR spectroscopy of variety of uh, nuclei. And when you go through those kind of a the breadth of the NMR of the periodic table, then you come across a lot of cases where there is a paramagnetic. So, therefore, paramagnetic NMR also dominates. So, solid state NMR of a variety of nuclei, not just carbon hydrogen, variety of nuclei, transition metals, main group elements, all those things are a part of it. The second aspect is that the paramagnetic, because many of these systems will have an unpaired electron. Uh, so, an unpaired electron in a magnetic field will have a magnetic moment and this magnetic moment will interact with the magnetic moment of your nucleus. Solid state, why should it be different from the, uh, from the solution? You know very well in the solution the molecules do not sit idle, do not sit tight, do not sit in a particular lattice. They keep moving, they keep rotating, they keep translating, they are randomly, random orientations they, they do assume because the solution properties and tumbling of these. Therefore, you do not have a fixed nuclear-nuclear interactions of the same type or a different type. So, bringing down that nuclear-nuclear interactions which are dipolar kind of interactions, that means you are making the whole spectrum very, uh, very fine, very narrow lines, etc. and that is what you call organic NMR or solution NMR. In contrast to that, in case of solid inorganic uh, compounds, in the solid state, the nuclei are fixed because they are in the lattice. So, they do not tumble, they do not rotate and they do not translate etc. They will have little vibrations, yes, no doubt about that. And so, therefore, wherever the orientation matches, you will have a strong dipolar-dipolar interaction. And also, the neighbor, different kinds of neighbors will be there. So, you will have both the chemical shift kind of anisotropy as well as the huge amount of line broadening and that is what the parameter. Additionally, as I told you, in the inorganic NMR, you go beyond carbon and hydrogen, many nucleus, they may not have just the I value half, they may have I value greater than half, which is, which is the quadrupolar kind of thing. And if they have a good, the sensitivity and the abundance, you can study their NMR. And then what do you have? We have already studied something called quadrupolar coupling. We have looked at these things in uh, the mass spectroscopy quite well. 
So therefore, you have not only dipolar coupling, you also have a quadrupolar couplings. So quadrupolar nucleus coupling with your NMR nucleus and that will be further. So these are the things that are specialized for the inorganic NMR. These are the specialized challenges the inorganic NMR needs to face. And uh, so as I said, this is very broad. You can see in this particular slide itself, variety of nuclei like silicon, sodium, aluminum, titanium, vanadium, variety of these things for the oxide, silicates, framework, layered material, zirconiums, all of these. Uh, phosphates where you have phosphorus nucleus and these glasses and ceramic material structural ceramic where you have the boron, nitride, zirconium, silicon, titanium, all these kinds of things. The barium, lead, see electromagnetic, electronic and magnetic materials and ion conductors, semiconductors, superconductors. You have seen the whole range of periodic table elements are there in the organic chemistry. I do not need to convince you that. So therefore, do we have the NMR cation to that? To a large extent. I would not say 100% but to a large extent. So many of these nuclei can be studied whether they are spin half, whether they are spin greater than half which is quadrupolar. But just like that you will not get by using the normal NMR techniques. And whatever I said uh, or half greater than half and some of the atoms will have both the nuclei. So th that is called isotopes. They may be a half isotope as well as greater than half isotope. So that means that NMO can be studied for a variety of elements and this periodic table will give you all that you can sit and look at. And those nuclei whose sensitivity is reasonable at least 0.1 with respect to NMO, uh, with respect to proton and reasonable amount of abundance, let us say 10 or more percent of relative abundance. In those cases, you can definitely study the NMR of those, those nuclei. Let they be the I is equal to half, let they be the quadrupolar because we have developed techniques to nullify all those effects that are coming on the spectrum. And as I said already, I explained to you just a while ago in the previous couple of classes, chemical shift anisotropy and that uh, the asymmetry parameters, asymmetry of the nuclei or with respect to the surroundings. So in solids, the, the central nucleus may have different kind of coordinations across. So therefore, that also uh, influences. So asymmetry, chemical shift, and isotropy will make the broaden, and these are all explained here, and the dipolar couplings. So because the nuclei are more or less fixed in a position, the, the interactions will be very strong, and that will make, uh, and of course, these vectors, orientation with respect to external magnetic field, all of these are important. Greater the magnetic field, greater the interactions as well, and this will also influence a lot. And these are dependent on the gyromagnetic ratios of the both the nuclei. And uh, so, how do you get out, get away with this? I explained to you there is something called magic angle spinning. Magic angle spinning is magic because this brings a kind of a tumbling equivalent motion, not tumbling motion, tumbling equivalent. So, in solution, the tumbling is bringing down the the width of the uh, line to a very narrow and here this magic angle spinning which is done with respect to one particular axis. Therefore, the all those nuclei which are oriented with respect to other perpendicular axis will also get uh, randomized and therefore you get. Of course, it is not as equivalent of the tumbling but the effect comes out to be the narrow area with that. That is not sufficient in some cases. In many cases that is sufficient enough but in quadrupolar nuclei etc where you have a very strong dipolar coupling, you need to add additional, could be a double, you know, a rotation, double spinning, these kind of things, as well as the multiple sequence of pulses you can use, therefore you can do the saturation of the signals. So that is a the cross polarization by using multiple pulse sequences and then you can play the time given between the pulse sequences so that you can nullify all those effects. So these are basically decoupled techniques, etc. So using that, you can. I've already demonstrated to you in the previous class the how a magic angle spinning, and I draw your attention to this particular slide here. You can see in the normal static state, you see a kind of a tower-type structure with the two blobs on either side. As you increase the spinning to a 10 kilohertz, okay, and um, 100 hertz, then 1 kilohertz, and then 10 kilohertz. So you can see the kinds of lines are getting further split and then narrowed down 
Of course, the width if you see at this line is not equivalent to at all the solution, but narrowed down with respect to so many. And what level of spinning is required? The level of spinning that you require is the kind of a width that you have and your spinning rate should uh, go uh, towards that. And by using different levels of spinning rates, you can derive all these anisotropy parameters. There are ways by which you can do, which is not a part of this particular course, but there are software parameters available which will deconvolute and give you all these uh, anisotropy parameters as well. Okay, that's where I think I stopped in the previous class. Let us look at now this NMR in the form of application, the, the solid state NMR in the form of application. Zeolites uh, is a particular zeolite called analcite, and this has got silicon, oxygen, and aluminum. And the silicon is surrounded by a different number of aluminum, different geometry uh, about the silicon, all these kinds of things. So, that is where you are trying to look at. So, in this is a, a silicon NMR, silicon is again half nucleus, so it's fine, you can get very nicely. And by using the magazine angle spinning, you can deconvolute all those spectra and this is done at a particular, uh, I have not given here, but it is done with a magic angle spinning uh, of a reasonable speed uh, that and you can see the spectrum A, kindly I draw your attention to this particular slide. You can see there is a peak at around uh, something like 83, 84, 87, 88 and 93 and uh, 98 etc. So, roughly you see a huge peak, a little smaller peak is a little smaller peak and little, little smaller and then almost getting. And these are when you compare with the standard spectra, you can find this is a silicon which has got four aluminum is the neighbors, three aluminum is neighbors, two aluminum is neighbors, one aluminum is neighbor and no aluminum is neighbor. So, they are all shifting by about 5 ppm and the intensities are very important. And please note that the area of each of this, you can take the area and take the ratio of this, that can give you a composition of what level of silicon with 4 aluminum, silicon with 3 aluminum, silicon with 2 aluminum are present. And by comparing such compositions, you can get the overall mineral structure, a mineral composition. And composition leads to the structure aspects as well. So, compositionally related structural aspects where you can get this. Though initially you get the composition, it can lead to the structural aspects of it. So, this means what you are basically talking is the silicon versus the aluminum ratio. So, there is another titration is shown below here, the silicon to aluminum. So, is 2.6 that means a large amount of silica, little amount of aluminum and 1.67 aluminum uh, silicon amount is decreased and further decrease, further decrease, further decrease almost almost to 1 to 1 kind of a ratio. So, as you do that, what happens is, when you have a large amount of silica, that means the silicon containing more aluminum neighbors will be less. So, you can see this here, this side is more, 4 almost nothing is there, 3 very little is there. Now, if I increase the numerator which is silicon content, then you can see the 3 is grown up, 2 is grown up, 1 is grown up, etc. If I make 1.6 is further. If I make it 1.35, I can get even silicon with the with the 4 aluminum, 3 aluminum, 2 aluminum, 1 aluminum, 0 aluminum. And if I go to almost close to 1.2 to 1 ratio, primarily what you get is silicon is surrounded by 4 aluminum, all other things are very less. So, that means this titration demonstrates very well that using the magic angle spinning and more in the solid powder, in the powder itself at a particular speed of the spinning you can try to deconvolute and get the ratio of silicon centers uh, surrounded by different kinds of aluminiums. From that you can get the whole composition can be built and the structural aspect can be built. This is a simulated spectrum. So, a peak comes for 0, a peak comes for 1, a peak comes for 2, 3 aluminiums respectively and then it is going there. So, this when you compare with this, you can say that at the almost 1.2 to 1 ratio of silicon to aluminum, you have the maximum level of aluminum available for silicon that is silicon with the four aluminiums in that. So, I hope it is clear how an NMR experiment is not one single measurement, several measurements, but NMR measurements can tell you the uh, clearly at the magic angle spinning 
utility will give you all the compositional ratios which can be used for the structural aspects of it. Okay, let us get into another example application of it. This is the magic triangle spinning NMR application for solid state thermal conversion of a clay mineral uh, to uh, kaolinite. Okay, and at particular temperature uh, and the silicon to aluminum ratio that you will have. And this is a, again aluminum NMR magic angle and you will see the lines here even after resolution are much broader than the uh, lines that you have seen in the previous slide for the silicon. We will see the reason etc. And this is done at a 14 tesla of your magnetic field and so what is this done is for the thermal treatment. Uh, this is a 1 is to 1 silicon aluminum layered clay mineral kaolinite SI4AL8OH12. Kindly look at this particular slide, I am just showing it. The spectra we have on the left side 150 degrees Celsius, 350, 550, 650, then on the right side 850, 900, 950, 1050. So, at different temperatures, the NMR is measured. And of course, at each temperature, you keep it for some time, heat it, and then study the NMR of that. What will that do? When you heat at this particular temperature and keep it certain time, the dehydration obviously starts taking place. When the dehydration takes place, of obviously the structural variations will also occur because many of the hydroxyl will join together and the water will eliminate. So you you have a formation of various structures. So and this is so you can see initially at very low uh, at low temperature and this uh, the dehydration alpha which is the degree of dehydration is nothing much. So, you know you have not done any dehydration basically. So, 0 0.0149 means not much. You can see a rather sharp and one single signal and you go to almost the same at 350. Though there is some features are coming here, I will explain you in a while. Then you go to the 550. So, this peak is one, there is another, another three coupled kind of a, I mean three peaks though they are not well resolved, but can be seen can be deconvoluted and understood. Then you go to 650 where the dehydration ratio is 0.991 degree of dehydration is that means huge amount of dehydration. So, as the de low dehydration high dehydration as the dehydration takes place more and more this more and more signals have come here though they are not 100 percent individually resolved. Now, come to the right side when you come to the 850 see dehydration already 0.99 etc it can only become maximum 1, it cannot go beyond 1, right. So, the dehydration does not change much, but the rearrangements of the things will change at different temperatures. So, you get mainly two peaks. So, out of this one peak will be overlaying with this, this side peak will be overlaying this, but these two have split. So, beyond temperatures of 800 to 900, these two features have further split and become individual lines and the first line is almost disappeared, the first line is almost disappeared. And what you find is some broad feature uh, on this side and that continues to be there and a small light feature on this side too. And that uh, broad features on the right side and the left side signify the amorphous silica formation. And these ones or uh, this is mainly for 6 coordination and one of these is 5 other is 4. So, the aluminum coordinations of the 4 and the 5 and the 6 of which initially they are primarily 6 as you keep dehydrating the 6 will reduce and then become 5 and 4. So, and this 5 and 4 are characteristic for this kaolinite which is a metastable form that is formed at 650 degree Celsius and that is what you are finding. So, at the later stage uh, both 4 and 6 coordinate uh, forms together. So, 4 and 6 are uh, finally found. So, so there and then you have a small uh, the multiple uh, components based on the mass uh, silicon NMR. These are this silicon NMR is not shown here, only the aluminum NMR is uh, shown here. Now, I mentioned to you that the even after at high temperatures using the MA, uh, MAS technique, magic angle spinning technique, still the lines are very broad. The reason is this is from an aluminum nucleus, the NMR. Aluminum nucleus is, uh, is a quadrupole nuclei. Silicon is not a quadrupole nuclei because spin is half. So, therefore, further 
uh, you know, uh, the breadth coming from the in quadrupolar interactions. And that requires additional technique too. Yes, magic angle spinning can diminish quadrupolar interactions of, of uh, the first order level, not the higher level. So that is why you are still finding this one. So example 1 previous, a silicon anemore, example 2 now, which is this one, the aluminum anemore and the differences, I hope you understand that. So the coordination number is also playing a role with respect to the central ion and that is what you are finding 4, 5, 6 and at the end 4 and 6 are the ones which are made. Okay, if you wanted to you know sort of uh, you know, try to reduce this strong, I mentioned to you in a soil state you always have a very strong dipolar coupling, why? Because they are all held, nucleus are held, the atoms are not rotating, uh, not translating etc. So therefore their vectors are fixed with respect to the external magnetic field, therefore the interactions are very strong in many cases, therefore that will broaden. So such strongly coupled systems require one is fast rotation, that is what magic angle is feeling, but not sufficient, you require multi pulse decoupling. Okay. So, you can use a hydrogen hydrogen decoupling, fluorine fluorine decoupling or and both homo and uh, hetero, but in this case homo nuclear coupling. In some cases heteronuclear coupling is also required. So, these strong in the in the molecule in the solid is a lattice and there is a these are all held up and therefore, you have the each nuclei is held stable and therefore, you have a strong dipolar coupling of this. Okay, so this particular example shows uh, that uh, different proton sites in the silica gel. So this is from a silica gel and different proton sites and if you look at the basic spectrum of this one, it gives a very broad which has got, if you deconvolute, you will find uh, SiOH kind of things, then hydrogen bonded and then fizzy soft water. So, the protons coming from water, protons coming from hydrogen bonded SiOH, protons coming from the SiOH, less hydrogen bonded or non hydrogen bonded. So, at least three different types of signals you can try to find in this original spectrum as a deconvolution, and then this is the simulated. So, you can now if you use the, uh, of course, fast rotation, that is the 10 kilo resolved model, 10 kilohertz here. So, the spinning is done at 10 kilohertz and then you would see this is the spectrum A, there is 1, there is 2 and the broad feature. So, all the 3 are there, but these two, 2 are prominent and this is much less. Now, what you do is you apply a pulse, a heat okay, and uh, evacuate under the vacuum conditions at 25 degrees Celsius for a certain period and at 200 degrees Celsius for a certain period and 500 degrees Celsius for a certain period. So, then you take. So, what do you get? This broad feature is gone and the second sharp feature is also gone and then only one feature. And what is you getting? The isolated SiOH. So, you are using, you are losing fizzy soft, you are using, losing as hydrogen bonded SiOH. So, as you increase the heating and keeping it there for some period and under the vacuum. And when will it come? It will come not only the magic angle spinning, but also the rotation is combined with multiple pulse method. So, this multiple pulse method can also be used time wise. I will show you in another example. So, here a fixed time, but at different temperatures. So, heat for some let us say 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, etc., whatever the conditions they are, and uh, after that you measure the NMR. So, at 1200 heat, measure the NMR, at 500. So, all these are heated at a, in a vacuum. So, that will give you dehydration aspects that will change these hydrogen bondings, all the species itself. So, you can study very well. So, in the previous examples, only spinning, here spinning plus a decoupling. So, it is a multi pulse decoupling. The here it is primarily the homonuclear decoupling kind. As I said, in the multi pulse, you can also use the time sequence as well. Okay. Now, here is another example of silicon. NMO studies with the, the cross polarization magic angle spinning. So, these effects will be taken care. So, this is the silicon NMO, the, you will find the silenols SiOH, single silenol, geminal silenol, 
and siloxane. So each one of these you will find differently in that. So SiOSI4, SiOSI3OH, SiOSI2OH twice. So they come at different and you can get a reasonably well resolved level of each and you can deconvolute and quantify also. So the quantification. So this quantification can be done with a different times, you know, contact times. So you have the, when you use that uh, CP mask, the, the pulses, you can use the contact, cross polarization contact times. So here for each of this, you can measure the area at different contact times. So that means at each contact time, you measure spectrum. Next contact time, measure spectrum. Another contact time, measure spectrum. So you measure the spectra at whatever the number of para points that you have in this. So maybe 15, 20 spectra you will measure. In each spectrum, you will deconvolute, you will take the area of peak 1, peak 2, peak 3 and that is what is plotted. This is for the, this is for the SI, OSI4 for this peak. This one is the OH2 and this one and this one is for this peak. Okay. So 1, 2, 3 peaks. So 1, 2, 3 uh, the curves and that is where. So what is the difference? You use at a different ray, a different timings at the contact time for the cross polarization. So the polarization transfer is given some time after the pulse to so that the transfer can occur. Play, occur. So at uh, 5 seconds, uh, milliseconds, 10 up to about 40 milliseconds is done. So from this you can get all the parameters of the corresponding cross polarization. Every uh, information can be obtained that is not a part of this. You can get the relaxation times as a T1P rate of cross polarization and you can see that all of these can be obtained in that. So I hope, so we are going slowly from magic angle in NMR to the simple uh, spin half to the spin greater than half then we have gone to the, the rotation followed by the sequence, the decoupling or cross polarization examples etc. Now just now we talked about the cross polarization timing, one more example is given over here. And this is the sodium case NMR, 1H sodium, a CP mass. So the, here the transfer is between the 1H to the Na. This is called heteronuclear. So earlier examples we have seen homonuclear, here heteronuclear, so kind of things. So between one of them is quadrupolar, one of them is normal, I is equal to half. So here 1H aluminum, 1H sodium, silicon aluminum, silicon is half aluminum, like that. So th all these kinds of cross polar can be done. And one of them is a quadrupolar nuclei. So you take the simple spectrum here. This is for Na2B4O7 10H2O. The two broad features. Now you apply on this. This is a static spectrum. This is a magic angle spectrum, uh, spinning spectrum. And you can start seeing two different signals. Then static, uh, the magic angle spinning followed by dipolar decoupling. Dipolar decoupling, DD. So you can see further splitting of this. And this one is further uh, used, dipolar decoupling of that. So CP transfer, transfer takes place. That means you allow certain time gap between the pulses so that the cross polarization occurs. So here there is no time allowed. So it's time allowed. So you get further splitting of this. So these are the four levels, static, magic angle spinning, the spinning plus the uh, dipolar decoupling, the cross polarization, magic angle and dipolar decoupling. Now, when you use this uh, cross polarization, you have a contact time. So, if you change the contact times to 0.2 up to 20 milliseconds, you can see the level of uh, the resolutions. Then you can take the individual, you can compare and get the information. So, this is the sodium and more signals due to different sodium atoms signal intensity variations as a function of both dipolar coupling and contact time. And that can be related to the relative distance of these different sodium atoms from the nearby protons. Okay. So these are the way that you can resolve the structural features of all such examples of that. So one another example I have here is uh, for the quadrupolar magic angle and DOR double rotation or double spinning. So what does it mean is that I mentioned to you earlier the magic angle spinning will do single with respect to single axis, any one of the axis uh, most conventionally is that. But now you can do rotate with respect to two like this. So you have one rotation like this, another rotation like that. So in the spinning, two different axes. And of course, that is instrumentation which will do. That is called double rotation 
or double spinning either of these. So not with respect to one axis, with respect to two axis. Why? I mentioned earlier itself to you, when you have a quadrupole nuclei, one rotation with respect to one particular axis is not going to resolve your spectra enough. Uh, we saw that example, even, even then we have, see here, you see that quadrupole nuclei is there, still not enough mass spectra. Now, here in this example, so you are using both the magic angle with respect to double rotation. And that, of course, more details you can read and see that this A of uh, magic angles spinning spectrum of dehydrated VP, uh, there is aluminum phosphate. So then you have the DOR of the dehydrated. You take the dehydration and you apply the double rotation. That means with respect to two axes, your spinning is not with respect to one axis, with respect to two. So that means it is rotating in one direction, also rotating in another direction. Let's say X and Z or Y and Z uh, and, uh, or X and Y. So these are the kinds of things. So therefore you have more uh, tumbling kind of emotions occurring. So the dehydrated one, you can see each one of these will have a different the aluminum site. Something like 5 coordinated, 4 coordinated, 6 coordinated alumina. And now these two C and D or from a dehydrated one start doing the rehydration of that. So dehydrated or partially rehydrated. You take the dehydrate, add a small amount of water, measure here, small add some more amount of water, measure D. So you can see the lines which are becoming sharper and as more water this side lines are more and this side lines are less and less water this side lines are more and this. So that means your coordinations are varying. So it's uh, already given here there are to exhibit eight different partially overlapping aluminum sites due to range of various four, five and six coordinate aluminum. So the five coordinated peak F and six coordinated aluminum peak C uh, likely contain coordinated water following dehydration of the two original tetrahedral. So the, these two were the two tetrahedral aluminum centers and further splitting you have seen here and then so these are the re rehydration. Now you can understand the magic angle spinning followed by double resonance can give much more data information uh, on these things. We will look at uh, a couple of more examples of uh, this, uh, these kind of uh, systems and then we will look at the paramagnetic NMR in the coming up class and with that uh, hopefully we will be able to you know complete the uh, session on the NMR spectroscopy of inorganic compounds. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.